Good evening. The Nixon presidency is virtually being overtaken by events tonight. One of Mr. Nixon's Senate leaders, Griffin of Michigan, and his chief House Judiciary Committee defender, Wiggins of California, both asked for his resignation. The president himself admitted he has lost his impeachment fight in the House, that he has not always given the public the straight story on Watergate, and that he withheld from his lawyers and the House committee certain damaging information. Dan Rather reports. The president made public three transcripts of meetings with his former chief aide, H.R. Bob Haldeman, all June 23, 1972. This was six days after the Watergate break-in, three days after an earlier discussion of Watergate with Haldeman, the tape of which has been mysteriously erased, and one week before John Mitchell was dismissed as presidential campaign manager. This is the first time that contents of these June 23, 1972 tape recordings have been made known outside of the White House. With the new transcripts, the president issued a written statement of his own. In it, he acknowledges that what the transcripts say is, as Mr. Nixon puts it, at variance with what he told the American people on other occasions. In this regard, the president acknowledges that he has known this since last May. Thus, he acknowledges that he has known for three months what his own lawyers, his defenders in Congress, and the American people didn't know. Mr. Nixon apologizes for this, expresses deep regret that it happened, says he did not intend for it to happen. Whether this new revised presidential statement becomes the so-called smoking pistol, proving clear-cut guilt, or merely, as the president put it today, a potential problem, Mr. Nixon, in effect, leaves to the United States Senate to decide. For in his new statement, the president concedes that he will be impeached, probably, by the House of Representatives and tried by the Senate. Correspondent Fred Graham will have precise examples of the differences between what the president said before and what the new transcripts show later in this broadcast. In his personal statement accompanying the new transcripts today, the president says, quote, I recognize that this additional material I am now furnishing may further damage my case, especially because attention will be drawn separately to it rather than to the evidence in its entirety. The president ends his written statement by saying, again, direct quote, I am firmly convinced that the record in its entirety does not justify the extreme step of impeachment and removal of the president. I trust that as the constitutional process goes forward, this perspective will prevail. End of quotation. CBS News was told tonight by two sources who declined to be identified that Chief of White House Staff Alexander Haig has been talking directly with Mississippi's Senator James Eastland and that Eastland had told Haig that prospects for the president's case in the Senate just now do not look good. The White House indicated that this story was not true in its entirety. Eastland, contacted by CBS News, said, I never told Haig anything approaching that. Dan Rather, CBS News, the White House. The June 23, 1972 White House conversation is only one of many ordered released by the Supreme Court, but it is a crucial one for it occurred so soon after the Watergate break-in. Fred Graham reports now on the so-called presidential variances acknowledged today. President Nixon's basic defense on Watergate was first laid out in detail in a long statement he issued on May 22, 1973. In that statement, the president said this about his order that the FBI go slow in investigating the Mexican laundering of money found on the Watergate burglars. I was advised that there was a possibility of CIA involvement in some way. It was certainly not my intent nor my wish that the investigation of the Watergate break-in or of related acts be impeded in any way. In the transcript released today, H.R. Haldeman tells President Nixon just six days after Watergate, Haldeman. Now on the investigation, you know the Democratic break-in thing. We're back in the problem area because the FBI is not under control. The way to handle this now is for us to have Walters call Pat Gray and just say, stay the hell out of this. Then Haldeman explained that the problem was that the FBI was tracing some of the money back to the committee to re-elect the president and its chairman, Marie Stan, Mr. Nixon. It isn't from the committee, though, from Stan's Haldeman. Yeah, it is. Directly traceable. Then last April 29th, when Mr. Nixon announced his decision to make public the edited White House transcripts, he said the following. In these folders that you see over here on my left are more than 1,200 pages of transcripts of private conversations I participated in between September 15, 1972 and April 27 of 1973 with my principal aides and associates with regard to Watergate. As far as what the president personally knew and did with regard to Watergate, a 
and the cover-up is concerned, these materials, together with those already made available, will tell it all. Today, the president admitted that this was untrue. He said he was speaking from memory, which was mistaken, and that as a result, quote, those arguing my case, as well as those passing judgment on the case, did so with information that was incomplete and in some respects erroneous. This was a serious act of omission for which I take full responsibility and which I deeply regret. President Nixon's statement today said that he has no way at this time of being certain that other mistakes in his prior statement will not subsequently come to light. But he said he has no reason to believe that this will happen. Fred Graham, CBS News, Washington. Reaction on Capitol Hill to the president's statement that he had withheld information from the Congress was quick and angry. Bruce Morton reports. Mr. Uh, I really am not prepared at this moment to make any comment at all. Are you considering resigning the because your The president's lawyers, James St. Clair and J. Fred Buzzart, brought the news first to the House and then the Senate. No commenting reporters' questions, saving their explanations for meetings with what had been the president's hardcore defenders. But the hardcore turned hot and angry as molten steel. Three who fought for the president on the Judiciary Committee, for instance. Charles Wiggins of California. The president personally agreed to certain acts, the purpose and intent of which were to interfere with the FBI investigation of the Watergate break-in. These facts standing alone, Wiggins said, are legally sufficient, in my opinion, to sustain at least one count against the president of conspiracy to obstruct justice. I have reached the painful conclusion that the President of the United States should resign. Failing that, the President's career must be terminated involuntarily. Delbert Latta of Ohio, we're going to have to do some rethinking. This was evidence that was withheld from us. This is part of an obstruction of justice. Charles Sandman of New Jersey, it certainly changes my vote. This is devastating. A key undecided Republican, Barbara Conable of New York. Uh, it's tough to put your loyalty in, in someone who abuses it. And I think that's the way many Republicans are going to feel. Early, Senate Republican Whip Griffin of Michigan suggested the president resign. Where both the national interest and his own interest will best be served by resigning. It's not just his enemies who feel that way. Many of his best friends, and I consider myself one of them, believe now that this would be the most appropriate course. Needless to say, this would be a, an awesome, very difficult decision for him to reach. But I believe that he will see it that way too. After learning of the conversations released today, Griffin said he was disappointed that the president's decision to stay seems irrevocable. The impact of today's events will take time to measure but it seems clear already that President Nixon's fight to avoid impeachment in the House is dead, and his chances to survive a Senate trial are increasingly uncertain. Bruce Morton, CBS News, Washington. Today's explosive Watergate developments occurred as Vice President Ford was returning from another of his trips around the country. Phil Jones reports. The vice president was in New Orleans when the Camp David activity started. Asked at the time if he had any idea what was going on, the vice president so said no, he didn't, but he wished he did. As one aide put it, we are as tuned in as we usually are, but he said don't forget the president didn't tell us in advance that he could die of phlebitis when he was in the Mideast. So why would you think he would keep us informed now? The vice president returned to his office this afternoon, where he has been since. He has not met with the president, according to his press aide, but a few moments ago, he did issue the following statement. Says Ford, I have not listened to the tapes, nor have I read the transcripts of the president's conversations with Mr. Haldeman. Without knowing what was said in the context of it, my comments would serve no useful purpose, and I will have none. Indeed, I have come to the conclusion that the public interest is no longer served by my previously expressed belief that on the basis of all the evidence known to me and the American public, the president is not guilty of any impeachable offense under the constitutional definition of treason, bribery, or other high crimes and misdemeanors. Mr. Ford continued to say, there are no precedents to guide me on this except my conscience, and I refuse further comment at this time. Bill Jones, CBS News, Washington. As part of its impeachment evidence, the House Judiciary Committee had 19 White House tapes. Today, other members of the House began listening to those tapes. Connie Chung reports. 
About half of the House members trickled into four rooms, donned earphones, and for the first time listened to five White House tape recordings. Nineteen conversations will be played and replayed from morning until night all this week. Members emerged with different reactions. Democrat Benjamin Rosenthal said the cover-up comes through, you can sense it. Republican Jack Edwards said he heard nothing to change his position against impeachment. Undecided Democrat David Bowen said he was left with a more sympathetic impression of the president's words. But undecided Republican Frank Horton had a different view. I'm appalled at the attitude of the people that are talking, the language that's used, uh, the manner in which uh, things are expressed in the presence of the president. To that extent, it's damaging. And I also think that some of the information that's contained in the tapes is very damaging with regard to the question of impeachment. Tomorrow, the March 21st tape in which the president discussed hush money payments will run repeatedly almost every hour of the day. Connie Chung, CBS News, Washington.